It has been an extraordinarily difficult time for everyone in health and care. Flu has made this winter particularly tough, first because we are facing the worst flu season for 10 years. The number of people in hospital with flu this time last year was 50. This year it was over 5,100. Next because it came early and came quickly, increasing sevenfold between November and December. It also came when GPs and primary care and community care were at their most constrained. And just as flu affects the population, it also affects the workforce too, leading to staff sickness absence that constrains supply just at the same time as it also increases demand. And, Mr Speaker, these flu pressures come on top of COVID, with over 9,000 people in hospital with COVID, while exceptional levels of scarlet fever activity and an increase in strep A has created further pressure on A&E. And all of this, of course, comes on top of a high historic starting point. So we did not have a quiet summer with the significant levels of COVID, and delayed discharges were more than double what they were during the pandemic. So to put this in context for the House, in June 2020 there were just 6,000 cases of delayed discharge per day, those patients ready to leave hospital who were medically fit to do so, whereas throughout last year it was between 12 and 13,000 a day. So, Mr Speaker, the scale, the speed, the timing of our flu season has combined with the ongoing high level of COVID admissions in hospital and the pandemic legacy of high delayed discharge to put real strain on frontline services. Mr Speaker, since the NHS began preparing for this winter, there was a recognition that this year had the potential to be the hardest ever. That is why there was a specific focus on vaccination. There were 9 million flu shots and 70 million autumn boosters. We extended eligibility more widely than in the past to cover the over 50s and became the first place in the world to have the bivalent COVID vaccine, which tackles both the Omicron strain and the original COVID strain. NHS England also put in place plans for the equivalent of 7,000 additional beds, including the introduction of virtual wards of the sort one can see at Watford General Hospital. Uh, and that innovation is still at an early stage of development, but has the potential to be significant in reducing pressure on bed occupancy in hospitals. In Watford alone, it has saved the equivalent of an extra hospital ward of patients. In addition, our plan for patients put 500 million specifically into delayed discharge, with a further 600 million next year and 1 billion the year after. And while the funds are already started to make a difference, efforts have taken time to ramp up operationally with local authorities and the local NHS. In addition, our 42 integrated care boards, recognising how bed occupancy in hospitals and social care are connected, will fully integrate health and care in the years to come, but likewise are at an early stage of maturity, with ICBs only becoming fully operationalised in July 2022, so less than six months ago. So, Mr Speaker, our plans involving integration of hospital care and social care additional funding into discharge, increased step-down capacity, the equivalent of 7,000 additional hospital beds and a vaccination programme at scale have provided groundwork for the government response, but it is clear we need to do more right now in light of the level of flu and COVID rates. And given hospital occupancy remains far too high and emergency departments are too congested. Recognising this, we launched the Elective Recovery Task Force on the 7th of December, and in the coming weeks, we will publish our urgent and emergency care recovery plans. And NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care have been working intensively over Christmas on these plans, which were reviewed with health and care leaders at the NHS Recovery Forum in Downing Street on Saturday. The recovery falls into three main areas of work. First, steps to support the system now, given the immediate pressures we face this winter. Second, steps to support a whole system response this year to give better resilience during the summer 
and autumn. Because as we saw with the heat wave this summer uh, and the levels of COVID, pressure is now sustained throughout the year, not just as in the past during autumn and winter periods. And third, I work alongside these two areas on prevention to maximise the step change prevention, uh, potential of proven technologies such as work virtual wards and the wider adoption of innovations such as operational control centres and machine reading software to treat more conditions in the community away from reaching the emergency department in the first place. Mr Speaker, let me set out the first of these with the measures I can announce today to provide support to the NHS and local authorities now. First, we will block book beds in residential homes to enable around 2,500 people to be released from hospitals where they are medically fit to be discharged. When combined with the ramping up of the 500 million discharge funding, uh, it will unblock, uh, which will unblock an estimated one to 2,000 delayed discharge cases, capacity on wards will be freed up, which in turn enables those patients admitted by emergency departments to move to wards, which in turn unblocks ambulance delays. It is important, however, that we learn from the deployment of a similar approach during the pandemic by ensuring the right wraparound care is provided for those patients released to residential care, which I have asked NHS England to particularly focus on. So it is the shortest possible stay on their journey home and into domiciliary care. And indeed, it is in the NHS's own interests for those stays to be as short as possible. Taken together, this is a £200 million investment over the next three months. Next, our a es are also under particular strain. From my visits across the country, I have seen and heard how they often need more space to enable same-day emergency care and short stays post-emergency uh, department. So our second investment today is more physical capacity in and around emergency departments. By using modular units, this capacity will be available in weeks, not months. And our £50 million investment will focus on modular support this year, and we will apply funding from next year's allocation to significantly expand this programme ahead of the summer. We are giving trusts discretion on how best to use these units to decompress their emergency departments, so that might be spaces for short-stay post a &E care, where there is no need for the patient to go to a ward for further observation or for discharge lounges where previously they have not been able to take patients uh, in a bed. Uh, many of those are often simply chairs. Uh, and uh, also additional capacity alongside the emergency department at the front end uh, of the hospital. Mr Speaker, the third action we are taking to support the system right now is to free up frontline staff from being diverted by CQC inspections over the coming weeks. And the CQC have agreed to reduce inspections and focus on high-risk providers in other settings like mental health. Mr Speaker, those are the actions we're taking that will have an immediate effect. Turning now to the measures we're taking now that will give greater resilience into this summer and next winter. We now have 42 NHS system control centres in operations uh, across England, staffed 24 hours a day, some days a week tracking patients on their journeys through hospitals and helping us identify blockages earlier and getting through, uh, flow through the systems. Where we have implemented these systems, such as the one I saw in operation in Maidstone, they have had a clear impact. So we're going to allocate funding in next year's settlement to apply this more widely. Similar to this, we've also seen how the use of artificial intelligence and data can demonstrably reduce demand and release patients sooner. NHS England has been tasked with clarifying and si simplifying this procurement landscape, taking on board best international practice, so that a small number of scale of in interventions are taken forward, where international experience shows they can deliver meaningful benefits to patients. Next, Mr Speaker, we will capitalise on the incredible potential of virtual wards. Last week at Watford General Hospital, I saw how patients who have been in hospital beds were treated at home through a combination of technology and wraparound care, where patients released sooner 
uh, were often much happier knowing they were receiving clinical supervision and always have the safety net of being able to quickly return to hospital should their condition deteriorate. There is scope to expand this to many more conditions and many more hospitals in the months ahead. Next, Mr Speaker, we are opening up more routes for NHS patients to get free treatment in the independent sector and offering an even greater patient choice. The Elective Recovery Task Force is helping us find spare operating theatres, hospital beds and outpatient capacity. There are also steps we must take in primary care. We are clear there are many more things our community pharmacists can support with, uh, which will ease pressure on general practice. From the end of March, community pharmacists will take referrals from urgent and emergency care settings, and later this year we will also start offering oral contraceptive services. But I want to do even more, and indeed as they do in Scotland. And we will work with community pharmacists to tackle barriers to offering more services, including how we better use digital services. The Primary Care Recovery Plan will set out a range of additional services pharmacists can deliver. Finally, Mr Speaker, notwithstanding the very severe pressures, we know that to break the cycle of the NHS repeatedly coming under severe pressure, the best way to reduce the numbers through our front doors is to address problems away from the emergency department itself. On Friday, we signed a memorandum of understanding with BioNTech, a global leader in mRNA technology, to bring vaccine research to this country. This will give as many as 10,000 UK patients early access to trials for personalised cancer therapies by 2030. This builds on the 10-year partnership we struck with Moderna in December to also invest in our mRNA R&D in the UK and to build state-of-the-art vaccine manufacturing uh, here. We're also reviewing our wider care for the frail elderly patients in care homes long before they would ever get to A&E or in our hospitals. Take, for example, the brilliant work they're doing in Tees Valley, where they're using community teams to help with falls to prevent unnecessary ambulance trips to hospitals. And we have looked at what more support we can offer elderly patients further upstream. With an ageing population and many more people with more than one condition, it is clear we have to treat patients earlier in the community and go beyond individual specialties to better reflect patients with multiple conditions and indeed to give the right support to people where they are, which is often at home or in residential homes. Mr Speaker, today's announcements provides a further £250 million of funding, which recognises that the spike in flu on top of COVID emissions, on top of high delay discharge numbers from the pandemic, will provide immediate support to reduce hospital bed occupancy and decompress A&E pressures, and in turn unlock much needed ambulance handovers. This builds on the 500 million announced uh, for discharge specifically at the autumn statement, which is ramping up, and the additional funding for next year. All of this work ultimately builds on the much needed greater integration between health and social care through the 42 integrated care boards, which we will, we will strengthen through the Hewitt Review, and through a step change in capability, including operational control centres. This immediate and near-term action sits in parallel with our wider life science investment, such as those deals with BioNTech and Moderna, and underscores our commitment to both recognising the immediate pressures on the NHS and investing in the science that will shift the dial on earlier upstream treatment at scale, particularly for the frail elderly and long before a patient reaches an emergency department. This is, Mr Speaker, a comprehensive package of measures, and I commend this statement to the House. We now come to Shadow Secretary of State to come forward. West Streeting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and a Happy New Year to you and to the rest of the House. And I thank the Health Secretary for advance sight of his statement. Uh, Mr Speaker, this winter has seen patients waiting hours on end for an ambulance, yeah. A&E departments overflowing with patients, and dedicated NHS staff driven to industrial action yeah. in the case of the nurses for the first time in their history yeah. because the Government has failed to listen 
and to leave. Yeah. I noticed the Secretary of State didn't take a moment to talk about the abysmal failure of his talks with nurses and paramedic representatives today. So let me say to him, every cancelled operation, delayed appointment and ambulance disruption due to strikes could have been avoided if he had just agreed to talk to NHS staff about pay. Today he could have opened serious talks to avert further strikes. Instead, he offered nurses and paramedics 45 minutes of lip service. If patients suffer further strike action, they will know exactly who to blame. But of course, the Prime Minister has already shown that he's not interested in solving problems. He resorts to the smoke screen of parliamentary game playing by bringing in legislation to sack NHS staff for going on strike. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask the Secretary of State, in, in these NHS sacking the staff bill, how many nurses is he planning to sack? How many paramedics is he going to sack? How many junior doctors is he going to sack? And this government has the audacity to ask NHS staff for minimum service levels. Yeah. When are we going to see minimum service levels from government ministers yeah. and the entire yeah. government? After arriving at the Derriford Hospital in Plymouth, an 83-year-old dementia patient waited in the back of an ambulance outside A&E for 26 hours before being admitted. This was the 23rd of December, when no strikes were taking place. The minister should listen. His family found him in urine-soaked sheets, and since arriving in hospital, he's contracted flu. His daughter said of the hospital staff, and I quote, they're polite, they're caring, and they are trying their best. It's just impossible for them to do the work they want to do. So let me say what the Health Secretary and Prime Minister refuse to admit. The NHS is in crisis, the biggest crisis in its history. It is clear to the staff who have been slogging their guts out over Christmas. It is clear to everyone who uses the NHS as a patient. The only people who can't see it are the government. What has been announced today is yet another sticking plaster when the NHS needs fundamental reform. The front door to the NHS is blocked, the exit door is blocked, and there simply aren't enough staff. So where is his plan to fix primary care so that patients can see the GP they want in the manner they choose? After 13 years of Conservative government, they don't have one. Where is his plan to recruit the care workers needed to care for patients once they've been discharged from hospitals and to pay them fairly so that we don't lose them to other employers? After 13 years of Conservative government, they don't have one. And where is his plan to train the doctors and nurses and health professionals the NHS needs? After 13 years of Conservative government, they don't have one. Well, we do, Mr Speaker, and he is welcome to Nick Labour's plan to abolish the non-DOM tax status and train 7,500 more doctors every year, 10,000 more nurses and midwives every year, double the number of district nurses and provide 5,000 more health visitors. A plan plan so good, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor himself admitted the Conservative government should nick it. But after 13 years of mismanagement, underfunding and costly top-down reorganisation, Organisations, all the Conservatives have to offer the NHS is a meeting and photo op in Downing Street. The collapse of the health service this winter could be seen coming from a mile away. Health and social care leaders were warning about it last summer. So why are the measures he set out today being announced in the middle of January? Why have care homes and local authorities been made to wait till this month for the delayed discharge fund to reach them? It's simply too little too late for so many patients. And in fact, this government is so last minute that after announcing this plan last night, they found an extra £50 million and sent out another press release. Now, I know most of us are happy to find a spare fiver lying around the house we didn't know was there. This Prime Minister seems to have £50 million quid stuck down the back of the sofa. What on earth is going on? No wonder they can't get money to the front line. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And, Mr Speaker, this is intolerable for patients who are fit and ready to leave hospital, who are then stuck there for months because the care they need isn't available to the community. They're not bed blockers 
And Mr Speaker, they are not an inconvenience to be dropped off at a hotel and forgotten about. No. They need rehabilitation at home rather than a bed in a care facility. Vulnerable patients deserve proper support suited around their needs, or they will fall ill again and go back to hospital. Right. And what about all these beds the NHS is procuring? What about the capacity that families need? I'll tell you what will happen. They won't get the care, yeah, and they will be coming exactly. right back through the front door yeah, of exactly. the A&E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the cycle of broken yeah, systems repeating themselves again and again. Yeah. And, Mr Speaker, where is the choice and control for patients and their families who may not want to be discharged to a hotel? I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, after 13 years, this just isn't good enough. Yeah. The Prime Minister might not rely on the NHS, but millions of ordinary yeah. people do. Yeah. They are yeah. sick and they are tired of waiting. Yeah. And look, 13 years of Conservative government now, 13 years, and look at what they have done to the yeah. NHS. Yeah, yeah. Did the Health Secretary listen to himself? Has he described the situation in hospitals of people waiting on chairs for discharge, exactly. sees the trolleys yeah. in the corridors, yeah. and people waiting longer than ever? Yeah. Whose yeah. fault is it? Yeah. Not the yeah. NHS staff who's threatening to sack, Mr yeah. Speaker. It's the Conservative ministers yeah. who've made disaster yeah. after disaster. After 13 years of Conservative government, it's clear. The longer they are in power, the longer patients will wait. Only Labour can give the NHS the fresh start and fresh ideas it needs. Well, Mr Seager, he, he talks about uh, a fresh start, but even his own uh, shadow cabinet colleagues don't seem to agree with his plan. His own uh, deputy seemed to distance herself from his plans to use the private sector. Uh, and his own shadow chancellor uh, seems to distance herself from his plans for GPs. And perhaps he can share with the House exactly how much his unfunded plans for GPs will cost. Because the chief exec of the Nuffield Trust has said, quote, it will cost a fortune and are based on an out of date view. So the point is, he has no, no plans uh, that his deputy and his own colleagues support. Uh, and he has not set out how he would fund those plans uh, in a way that would not divert the fact that the NHS in Wales, the NHS in Scotland, and indeed health systems across the globe have faced significant pressure as a result of the combination of COVID uh, spikes uh, and flu spikes, particularly in recent weeks. This is not a phenomenon that is limited to England uh, and the NHS. This is a pressure that has been reflected internationally, including uh, for the NHS uh, in Wales. He refers to talks uh, with the trade unions, and it is right that we are engaging with the trade unions. I was pleased to meet uh, the staff council of the NHS today, and indeed the chair of the NHS staff council, Sarah Gorton, said the discussions had made progress, notwithstanding one trade union leader who was not in the talks <coughs> given an interview outside the department uh, to comment on what had and had not been said in those talks, but we want to work constructively with the trade unions on that. Um, he says that uh, we are only announcing measures today, Mr Speaker, but again, he seems to have written those comments before he got a copy of the speech. The integrated care boards uh, took operational effect in July last year. The autumn, because they are scaling up, we are putting control centres uh, in place. We are integrating health and social care. Uh, we announced in the autumn statement, Mr. Speaker, 500 million for discharge, a further 600 million next year, a billion the year after, recognising the significant uh, pressure, and that is ramping up. NHS England set out its operational plans in the summer, including the 100 day discharge sprint. Uh, that set out, for example, the greater use of virtual wards, that is new technology that is being rolled out at scale. It also announced the extra 7,000 uh, community beds. Uh, and indeed, we also set out in our plan for patients the additional measures. But what is clear when we have a sevenfold increase in flu in a month? 50 cases admitted last year compared to 5,100 this year. You have a combination of a surge in supply on top of an existing high level position, and that surge in de uh, demand uh, corresponds with a constraint of supply because staff absences also increase because of flu. It's during the Christmas period when community services are more constrained, and those two together has created very significant pressure 
on our emergency departments, and that is why, right, uh, why, through the engagement I have had with health leaders, the two key messages they gave to me was the importance of getting flow into hospitals, which is constrained by the high bed occupancy. That is why getting people out of the hospital is so central to relieving pressure. And secondly, that within the emergency department specifically, we need to decompress those services. And so with same day uh, emergency treatment, uh, having short stay post the emergency department, that is a better way to decompress those emergency departments through the triaging and bringing other clinical specialties closer to the front door. We have listened to the NHS front line. Those were the two key requests uh, that were made to me, alongside other issues such as CQ inspections and how it reflects those. But we also need to, uh, alongside those immediate pressures, recognise that we had pressures last summer during the heat wave. We had pressures in the autumn, and that is why we have announced a wider set of measures today. So we have listened, we have acted, we have taken measures to deal with the immediate pressure, but we have also set out how we will build further capacity, which will go through into the autumn, and then alongside that we have signed deals, for example, with Moderna and BioNTech, and we are bringing forward the life science investment so that has a better impact on pressures on the front line. The Select Committee, Steve Bright. Thank you very much. There is no question that in some places more than others, patient flow in acute hospitals is the issue coming up the system. The Secretary of State is also right to say that demand is far outstripping supply, in part because of the, the very high flu numbers. So today's injection of funding is very welcome, as is the additional surge capacity the Secretary of State spoke about in his statement. I have to say his mention of prevention is especially welcome by me. Let's do so much more on this. Can I ask my right honourable friend, because another £250 million pounds is a lot of the public's money, what real-time oversight he has to ensure NHS England spend it wisely. <laughs> and can I just make a plea that domiciliary care is not overlooked here because the lack of care in people's homes is every bit the enemy of patient flow as a lack of the care home places which is identified today. Yeah. Well, he, he, he raises a, an extremely important issue in terms of getting flow into the system, not least because it is delays in ambulance handovers that leads to the highest risk in what is a whole system issue, which is that of the patient that isn't seen uh, where treatment uh, is delayed. And that is why flow through discharge is so important, because whilst that often concerns the, the back door of the hospital, it is actually the pressure at the front door that is most uh, acute. That was recognised uh, by the government in the autumn statement. That's why there was additional funding with the 500 million for delayed discharge. That has taken some time to ramp up. What we're recognising is because of the flu, there is an immediacy uh, in terms of the pressure on A&E that we need to address. Uh, he, his point, though, really speaks to one of the key lessons uh, from the COVID period, which is, is not simply about releasing patients from hospital who are fit to discharge. It is also about the wraparound services that are provided for those patients so that they then don't uh, get stuck in residential care uh, for longer and they're still able to go home and get those domiciliary care packages, and that is something that NHS England uh, is particularly focused on, so they have the wraparound services alongside that discharge. Dame May Hillier. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and a Happy New Year. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have seen this year in, year out. Money thrown into the NHS at a winter crisis point, too late to spend it sensibly, and yet this Government has been in power for nearly 13 years. Reading and listening to the Secretary of State's speech, I can't see what's new in it. We've yes. talked about discharge before and picking up on the point from the, selects, the Chair of the Select Committee, without proper funding for local councils for domiciliary care yeah. and for funding yeah. care homes, this will never work. Yeah. 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 Well, it will, in terms of uh, what is different, is the, uh, the block booking that this will enable, which will therefore give the residential care the ability to put in place the workforce uh, to release that um, delayed discharge to the 13,000 that are in hospital who are medically fit to discharge. The acceleration of releasing those patients will then enable the, the front door where the spike in flu is so acute 
uh, to be released. So that is what he's doing. And this responds to what health leaders themselves have said uh, is the key intervention we can take. But of course it's not in isolation. And her point is that this comes on top of the 500 million that was announced uh, during the autumn statement. But this is additional to give further capacity, recognising the significant pressure that the system is under. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight that this is not a purely a, an English issue. This is affecting health systems across the Western world. Uh, and I welcome many aspects of what he said today. I'm also very grateful to staff at Epsom Hospital and in the ambulance service in my constituency. But so much of the time, those paramedics is taking frail elderly people from care homes to A&E, where frankly they probably shouldn't be. What steps can he take to divert some of those frail elderly people out of A&E, take some of the pressures off, and actually get them to an environment where, uh, frankly, they'll be much better looked after? Well, I think that's where the, uh, he's absolutely right, and, and that's where the potential in terms of if one looks at virtual wards, virtual wards have um, uh, significant benefits both in terms of demand management, uh, in avoiding uh, elderly frail uh, patients coming into the emergency department uh, in the first place, but it also releases capacity out of hospital. So if I look at uh, the virtual ward at uh, Watford General Hospital, that was equivalent to an additional ward of the hospital where it's able to release patients who have the comfort of knowing that they're still under supervision, uh, their medical information is being tracked uh, and monitored, they get a daily phone call from a nurse, uh, but they also know if they need to come back into the hospital, they can do so uh, much more quickly, and that gives people the comfort and confidence to then recover at home, which is often where the patient wants to be, and indeed the uh, patient satisfaction uh, from that trial at Watford was over 90%. Ben Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker. Given there are currently 165,000 vacancies in social care, a 51% increase in just a year, where is he going to magic up the people to look after the people he wants to put in hotels? Well, the, the whole purpose of the 500 million is uh, to uh, put more support for local authorities into their funding in social care. Around a, a quarter of that funding is going specifically on workforce interventions, but we're also using uh, other measures as well. And one of the other things that we've been doing is boosting international recruitment as well. Uh, care sector staff are on the shortage occupation list, uh, and that is another, another way that we're boosting uh, workforce uh, recruitment. Morris. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the Secretary of State's uh, statement, in particular um, the additional money for discharge, but would he agree with me that uh, in regard to integrated care systems, that actually we really do need to accelerate that integration between health and social care, notwithstanding what he said about maturity. That's the key to the future of the integration of health and social care and will solve many of the problems that we face at the moment. I just say well, it is, and, and he's right, and that's why, uh, for example, in the run to Christmas, one of the ministerial priorities was meeting. We had a whole series of ministerial meetings with the chairs and chief execs of the ICBs, because it is through that integration of the 42 integrated care boards that we will bring health and social care together. Uh, the government has recognised that. They became operationally uh, in place from July last year. Those are ramping up. At pace. And one of the things that's making a real difference to them is having the, the uh, control centres that allow patient flow to be tracked through the system. Maidstone's a very good example of that. Uh, and that data is then allowing blockages in what is a whole of system problem to be gripped at a much earlier stage. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Sir Roger. Retention is at the heart of this crisis, both in the health sector and in the social care sector. And you can't retain staff if you don't pay them. And if you don't pay them in this year, they won't address the issues. Will he recognise when he set the remit for the pay review body, inflation wasn't where it was, we didn't have a war in Ukraine, but factors have changed, and therefore the remit must change for pay within this year so that we retain the staff to deliver what he's proposing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the point I make to the Honourable Lady is, in terms of delayed discharge, the key is having the domiciliary care uh, support. That is not actually about the NHS Agenda for Change contract, that is about uh, the funding for those in the social care uh, sector. Ar around a quarter of delayed discharge is due to delays in what is known as Pathway 1, the domiciliary care side. Uh, that is what the 500 million in particular recognise. So we are putting more money into that, but that is about the social care sector so we can get flow through delayed discharge. 
The Secretary of State has spoken about getting more people treated in the community, and I think we'd all support that, absolutely. He will also know that in the Whitton constituency, we have a higher than national average GP to patient ratio. It is a major problem for us. It has been for a long time. We're short of diagnostic facilities, and of course Essex County Council also need more resources to deal with adult social care for the very reasons that my right honourable friend has spoken about. Can he let me know? He won't be able to do this from the dispatch box today, but can he tell me? write to me, please, to give me the specific details of when on all three of those areas in Essex we will see the money that he has announced today actually come to the front line because our doctors and nurses need that money and the resources to do really why, what they joined the profession for, which is to give the care that they really believe in to members of the public. Well, firstly, uh, Mr. Joe Seeker, very happy to write to uh, my right and my friend with the, the further details. But just for the benefit of our, the House, in terms of the 500 million announced in the autumn statement, local authorities gave uh, the Department and NHS England their data returns on Friday. So we will have data that I'll be able to share more specifically in terms of the 500 million. In terms of the 250 million announced today, NHS England, that is for uh, very urgent delivery into systems, and that will be going out uh, extremely quickly. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. NHS leaders have told the Health Services Journal today that the government has just seven to ten days to get this additional funding to discharge hospital patients uh, to the front line for it to make any difference whatsoever. And the NHS Confederation has said that the next three months in the NHS will likely de be defined by critical incidents being declared. So, will the Secretary of State promise that this extra funding? will reach the front line in the next seven to ten days and will he please finally declare a national critical incident so we can mobilise every single bit of our NHS to save lives and save the NHS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the very purpose of the announcement today and I've done it on the first day that Parliament uh, is back is to give that urgent uh, uplifting funding to local authorities, to ICBs to act now, knowing that that funding uh, is available. They have the additional 500 million, which is ramping up as well, and that is part of a wider package of measures. As I say, uh, NHS England have been putting the community bed support in the 7,000. But the purpose is to recognise the very real immediate pressure the front line has been in. But that also needs to be viewed as something that other healthcare systems across the globe have also faced from what has been a very sudden and very significant spike in flu, seven times higher than last month and a hundred times what it was last year. Sir Edward Lee. Yes, but they also have COVID and flu in France or Germany or Italy or Sweden or Holland. And winter after winter, they cope far better because they have much more integrated social insurance systems. Now, some people like me have been banging on this for years, but now the former health secretary, the member for Bronzegrove, is suggesting a social insurance system. Newspaper editorial after newspaper editorial. What is our long-term plan? We can't leave the Labour Party to have a long-term plan, and we don't. How are we going to, how are we going to reform this centrally controlled construct so the people of my age pay taxes all their life and their only right is to join the back of a two-year queue? What is his plan? Secretary of State. Well, uh, firstly, uh, integrating between health and social care through the integrated care boards, that is what we put in place from July, recognising that actually the pressures on the NHS are often as much about pressure in social care as they are in N NHS uh, itself, particularly if you look at ambulances, often it is actually the delay in domiciliary care that is driving then that blockage on the wards, which in turn applies there. Secondly, it is recognising that there are workforce pressures, uh, and that is why NHS England have been working on the workforce plan, uh, which has uh, been set up. Uh, and thirdly, we have already set out our elective recovery plan. You saw, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. W. Speaker, will have seen uh, over the summer that uh, those longest waits of over two years were largely cleared. And from the front bench, they, they chunter as to how it's going. Well, if you look at how that is going compared to the Labour government's two year clearance in Wales, where there's over 60,000 or around 60,000 before Christmas in Wales waiting over two years, in England that was under uh, 2,000. So we are making progress on those longest waits through the work of Jim Mackey and Professor Tim Briggs and the Get It Right First Time. We are innovating with the surgical hubs, the community diagnostic centres. That in 
turn gives greater resilience to those electives that in the past used to be cancelled when there was winter pressure that then go on hot and cold sites where they're then much more resilient. But the final issue I must take with what he said is actually in France, in Germany, in Canada, uh, in many other countries, this massive spike in flu and Covid uh, pressure combined with the pressures from the pandemic has placed similar strains on other healthcare systems. So it is simply not the case to say that this is an issue that affects England and England alone. And Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Despite all the warnings, I'm really not clear how the government has got itself into this position of the biggest crisis in the NHS. We all know it's a no-brainer. You have to invest in social care to reduce bed blocking. So what exactly is the purpose of the pilot that's been announced for Hull and the Humber that will tell us what we already know, that what we need is investment in social care and reform of social care? Well, firstly, Mr Dorey, we, we recognised uh, very early, in, in fact, uh, in the summer, NHS England recognised that this winter was likely to be extremely hard, both because uh, population resilience to flu would be lower as a consequence of the pandemic uh, and because of the combination of the pan pandemic pe backlogs uh, and the ongoing level of COVID emissions. Over 9,000 cases in hospital with COVID, then a further, as I say, 5,000 from flu on top of the other strains from the pandemic that we have seen. But the measures that were being taken, such as boosting the vaccination programme, extending that to the over 50s, being the first place to have the bivalent uh, vaccine to address, uh, those were part of the package of measures that NHS England put in its operational plan. But we also reckon, to the heart of our question, that social care is central to this. And that is why, in the autumn statement, notwithstanding the other economic pressures that the government faced, health and education were prioritised, with the extra 6.6 .6 billion of funding into the NHS over the next two years and an extra £7.5 billion of funding into social care. So it was recognised that was a clear prioritisation in the autumn statement. The reality is we've had a massive spike in flu cases, which means we have a hundred times the number of hospital emissions from flu compared to last year. Holly Mumby Croft. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I firstly welcome the measures that my right real friend has, has set out for us today? And it's absolutely right that we consider a wide suite of measures. With that in mind, can I draw his attention to my own region? We have, I think, the second biggest ICB area by geography, but without the population numbers to match that. So can I ask him to consider an additional um, community diagnostic hub so that everyone in the area is able to, to access that? We need one, sorry, we need two, not one. So would you look at that, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Said. Well, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the importance of diagnostic centres, uh, and that is why that is one of the things that we have, uh, in particular, prioritised. Uh, as she knows, I am extremely keen that we accelerate that programme, so that where we award community diagnostic centres, that they are opening in 2023. Uh, in my view, too many of the plans were for 2024, so that is a particular challenge that I have been posing. Uh, but I know this is something she has campaigned strongly for on behalf of our constituents. I know the Minister of State uh, is very much looking at the proposal she has shared, and I know he will be happy to discuss it with her uh, in the days ahead. Maria E. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Hospitals used by my constituents in Liverpool and Knowsley have had queues at a and &E of 33 hours, 41 hours, 30-plus hours, have had dozens of ambulances queuing up outside for entire shifts, unable to transfer even one patient in an entire shift. These problems were predictable and, as he's just yeah. said, predicted. Yeah. Yet the Secretary of State disappeared over Christmas and the yeah. New Year yeah. when this was going on, only emerged last week to blame the problems on flu and COVID. Yeah. When is he going to acknowledge that leaving it until January to deal with an issue of winter pressures is too little too yeah, late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When is he going to take responsibility yeah, yeah. and apologise for the lamentable situation that he's left my constituents and many others across this country in? Fear, pain, worry. When is he going to say sorry for it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Mr Dubbins, it is simply not accurate. For example, uh, let me give her some specifics. The auxiliary contract with St John's Ambulance that we invested in, we put an extra £150 million into the ambulance service. We invested additional capacity into call centres, a further £50 million. Um, but also, it is important to note, we, the taxpayers spent £800 million pounds on the new Royal Liverpool Hospital. In, in 2018-19, Aintree, a brand new uh, hospital, was built there. So we have been investing uh, in there, uh, but it's also about recognising that it's not simply about investing in new hospitals, it's also about looking at the integration between health and care. And that is what the autumn statement recognised with the additional £500 million. Uh, pounds. But it's simply inaccurate to say that there weren't measures in the summer, such as the St John's Ambulance contract, the community first responders, the frail elderly service that has been put in place. These are all measures to, to help with demand management to prevent people coming to the emergency department in the first place. Sir Julian Lewis. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the government recognise that there is a danger of a major increase in pressure on the NHS resulting from any new variant of COVID that may be imported from China? And how quickly would be, we be able to identify such a new variant and prepare a vaccine against it? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, may I, and I'm sure the whole house, congratulate uh, my uh, uh, honourable friend on his, uh, the, uh, uh, his knighthood uh, from his, his Majesty. Uh, in, in terms of, of, of China, the, the analysis we have is that the, the variant in China uh, is the same as the variant in the UK. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the data that has been shared from China is often uh, not uh, as uh, clear as we would like. That is why uh, the Prime Minister and uh, uh, the Minister for Trans uh, the, my right to my friend, the Minister for Transport, announced uh, the proportionate measures over Christmas uh, in terms of uh, looking at um, uh, uh, positive tests for travellers, but in particular sequence variant testing for those coming into the UK. The purpose of that is to quickly identify any new variant in order to respond to the, the concern he highlights. Liz Savile Roberts. Strikes by nurses and ambulance workers are a last resort for overworked staff. They fear that patient safety is suffering due to increased demand and staff shortages. Now, instead of proper pay increases, Labour Welsh Government have responded by offering Welsh Health Service staff tokenistic one-off payments, and reportedly his government is considering the same in England as well. Now, if this approach is taken, can the Minister guarantee that one-off payments will be recognised as support with cost of living crisis rather than proper pay increases, and treated as such for tax and benefit purposes? Secretary of State. Well, firstly, as, as we have said previously, Mr Deputy process through the independent pay review body that looks at these issues in the round and balances what are the needs uh, in terms of our <coughs> NHS. Uh, obviously, my focus is on the NHS in England uh, more than uh, uh, the, it's for the Welsh Government in terms of the negotiation uh, in Wales, and balancing what is uh, the right uh, level of funding for retention and recruitment uh, against what are the wider issues uh, of affordability for the economy uh, as a whole. Uh, but we are very keen to engage with the trade unions. We had a good discussion uh, with them uh, today. Uh, I'm pleased that they recognised uh, that uh, made progress, uh, and I look forward to having further discussions with them. Siobhan Bailey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've had a few um, Stroud constituents in tears in recent weeks, um, as they've been with uh, loved ones in A&E and elderly residents um, stuck on, on trolleys. Um, no MP wants to deal with that, and I know you're working hard, and I welcome the announcements, but the public are watching more and more money go into the NHS. And what I think we need to hear very clearly is what is your assessment, what is my own or friend's assessment of when the new announcements, the more money, is going to make meaningful change in Gloucestershire's A&E departments and elsewhere? Well, I, I think it's a, a very fair challenge, and I, I would segment it into three sections. I think, firstly, there is a recognition that the combination of the, the legacy from the pandemic, the uh, ongoing COVID pressure, but particularly this massive spike in flu, creates an immediate pressure in our A&E, uh, and the package today recognises that. It shows we have listened to the front line uh, and, and responded to that. Uh, but the secondly, there is a recognition, uh, and it goes to some of the questions in the House today, uh, that the system has been under pressure for some time. 
and therefore the second phase is around looking at innovation technology, the AI, the virtual wards, the ways of doing things differently that actually, particularly if I take the frail elderly, addresses their needs upstream in the care home before they get to the emergency department or that releases them from hospital quicker, providing they have the safety net that they're part of a virtual ward where they're subject to ongoing clinical supervision and that if they need to come back to hospital, they can do so much more easily than would otherwise be the case. And stopping that, that boomerang of patients released early and then coming back. That's the second phase, and that includes, for example, the modular capacity as well, because to streamline, to triage, they need space, and it is that compression within the emergency department that also drives inefficiency and poor care. But there's also a third part, and this government has invested in its life science industry. Our R&D investment of 15 to 20 billion pounds is a big mark of that. And part of the prioritise is to say, actually, there are certain things we can do at scale with companies like Moderna, which will shift the dial in terms of healthcare. Uh, and that is a third but significant part, uh, particularly around the prevention work that we can do. Am I? There is not only having an impact on the acute service but on the mental health service as well. I have raised directly with the Secretary of State the problems facing Hull and Humber NHS Trust where we have um, learning, adult learning difficulty beds. 42% of those have been taken by patients with delayed discharge. The adult mental health beds, 17% have been taken by patients who are waiting for discharge. And in children and adolescent mental health beds, 22% of those are with patients waiting for a discharge from these hospital and mental health beds. So what investment and support is going to be given to providing the right social care and support services to enable not just beds to be freed up in the acute service, but beds to be freed up that are desperately needed in mental health services as well? Yeah. well the Honourable Lady is right to, to highlight mental health. It is an extremely uh, important part of this wider health uh, landscape. That's why the government's increasing funding to mental health, the extra £2.3 uh, billion uh, that is going in. Uh, but it's also about how we get better value for money from that spending uh, as well. And that is why, through the reform of the Mental Health Act that my uh, honourable friend, the Minister of Mental Health, uh, is taking forward, that will also help us better target that funding in ways that delivers value for money. Richard Graham. Roger. I joined the Health and Care Secretary in uh, paying tribute to those working in hospitals like the Gloucester Royal Hospital in my constituency so intensely uh, and under such heavy pressure. And while I welcome the changes he's announced, can the Health Secretary confirm what progress his department has made with the Home Office to prioritise Tier 2 health visas and also to provide <coughs> a grace period for international GP trainees? Lastly, could my right honourable friend consider helping staff with parking and out-of-hours food in this winter described by so many as a perfect storm. Secretary of State. Well, I, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I, I said in my uh, remarks uh, at, at the outset, um, the announcement today is part of the wider recovery programme, uh, which we discussed with health leaders uh, at number 10 on Saturday. Uh, that will have a number of components, one of which is uh, around the urgent and emergency care uh, recovery. Uh, work uh, is ongoing with Home Office colleagues in terms of the visa component uh, of that. He raises uh, an extremely important point, one that uh, a number uh, of clinicians on the front line have also raised with me, and it's something that I'm discussing with my right and well friend, the Home Secretary. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Over 5,000 operations have been cancelled at Barnsley Hospital in the last year. What is the Government doing to reassure people, those in Barnsley who are waiting in pain for delayed operations, and will they make sure that any new staff are deployed first to the areas that need it most? Well, I share her desire for us to reduce the backlog on uh, the electives programme. That is why the Government's invested a uh, further £8 billion. Pounds. Uh, but in order to ensure that that delivers value for money, the key focus now is building greater resilience into that elective programme through the surgical hubs, through the better use of community diagnostic centres, in particular by having a, a distinction between the hot and cold sites. What 
too often has happened in the past is as winter pressures have surged, so elective operations are cancelled in order to free up bed capacity. Uh, and by having the surgical hubs, having the hot and cold sites, that builds greater resilience. And that is, if I can pay tribute to, to the work of the Get It Right First Time team and, and uh, Professor Tim Briggs and Jim Mackey, that is exactly the programme they're leading. You saw the progress that was made in the summer on that. We're very focused on the next stage, which is 78 uh, we wait uh, and we're working very actively on that. Jason McCartney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Maple Ward at uh, Home Valley Memorial Hospital uh, used to provide much needed community intermediate care for those leaving Huddersfield uh, Royal Infirmary. Unfortunately, it temporarily closed, I think, around uh, six years ago. Does the Secretary of State agree with me that this is exactly the kind of facility that we need now in the community to not only give great intermediate care, but also to free up capacity at our main hospitals? He raises an extremely important point because whilst often the debate is on beds, it is, is uh, in reality as much about the workforce that goes with those beds uh, that we need to, to consider. And the point about step-down care is that it has a lighter uh, patient-staff ratio compared to what is necessary for uh, much more serious patients at the acute stage. So it is important that we look at the end-to-end -end capacity. That includes step-down care. That's why NHS England, in their summer plans, set out the 7,000 additional beds. But that, in turn, also includes doing things differently using technology. And the virtual wards allow some patients to be at home, which many patients prefer, but with the wraparound clinical support that virtual wards can provide. So virtual wards are part of that. So are, as he says, step-down in the community. Uh, and that is part of that wider landscape. Zara Sultana. Thank Mr Deputy Speaker. Iqbal fell seriously ill on Christmas Eve. His family rang for an, for an ambulance calling 999 three times, pleading for help. They waited for three hours, but by the time an ambulance arrived, it was too late. Paramedics desperately tried to save his life, but the 58-year-old father tragically passed away. His daughter Minnie was clear about who was to blame. It wasn't NHS staff, she said, but Tory government, who have left the NHS in what she called a disastrous state. So will the Health Secretary heed Minnie's words and undo 13 years of running down our NHS from giving NHS workers a proper pay rise to ending all forms of privatisation and giving the NHS the funding it desperately needs? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I regret the fact that there uh, are some patients and staff uh, in the emergency care that did not uh, receive uh, acceptable care. Uh, in recent weeks, but I, I just gently remind the Honourable Lady that that pressure, particularly around flu and COVID rates, is something that has put huge pressure on the NHS in Wales, in Scotland, uh, across Europe and indeed across the globe. Andrew Jones. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank my right honourable friend for this statement and welcome North Yorkshire's involvement in the trials he's announced today. He highlighted the increased bed occupancy that's come from the flu surge. Well, NHS North Yorkshire briefed me earlier this afternoon that the flu vaccination take-up in North Yorkshire was 64 percent. Uh, uh, that basically means that one in three people are not vaccinated. So does he agree with me that uh, more focus upon encouraging vaccination take-up is a way that we can all help uh, in alleviating this crisis and reducing demand upon hospitals? Mr Deputy, I, I very much agree with my uh, honourable friend in, in encouraging greater uh, vaccine uh, take-up, uh, and that is something I think across the House we can agree uh, is something to be uh, encouraged, and I hope all members will be uh, reinforcing uh, the UK HSA's uh, messages on the take-up on vaccine. We've expanded the scope to include the over-50s. Uh, we have a world-leading vaccine in the bivalent uh, vaccine which targets both Omicron uh, and the original strain uh, of flu, but it's also important that as many people as possible get their flu jab as well, and I encourage all members to support that. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Sir Roger. The NHS and social care are in unprecedented crisis, even if that's a word that both he and the Prime Minister refused to use. We know that resilience was stripped out of our NHS years before the COVID pandemic. And I come back to the level of vacancies, 133,000 in our NHS, 165,000 in social care. So will the Minister admit that as well as growing the workforce, we urgently need to keep the workforce that we have? And if so, why isn't the government at least 
meeting the nurses halfway on pay as the RCN have offered, and why, after 13 years of Tory government, is the average care worker pay less than pay at McDonald's or at Amazon? Secretary of State. Well, Mr. Derby, it, it, within that list, it would have been uh, welcome had she recognised the significant investment the government's made in Brighton in a new hospital yeah. as part of the additional funding that we're making. There's also more doctors, more nurses uh, within the NHS this year than there were last year. But to her point on uh, social care, uh, part of the purpose of the £500 million that the Chancellor announced uh, in the autumn statement was to recognise the pressure on workforce. That is why that funding was prioritised. That is also why Home Office colleagues have put uh, social care workers on the shortage occupation list to better enable us to also attract international talent. Robin Walker. Uh, my right honourable friend uh, has made many sensible points in his statement, but he'll forgive me if I focus on the local uh, aspect of things in Worcestershire, where, as he knows, pressures have remained very uh, acute. Uh, our two uh, A&Es uh, over December saw 14,000 attendances. That's up from 12,500 the year before and 10,600 uh, the year before that. And the Hospital Trust uh, tell me that on any given day in December, they had a, around 100 patients who could be cared for somewhere else in hospital uh, beds. Given that, I, I read one of his press releases today amounts ex, uh, extra funding for neighbouring Warwickshire. Uh, can I urge him to ensure that out of this £200 million funding package, a significant amount reaches those Worcestershire hospitals uh, and to remember the acute need to upgrade at a and &E, something I understand is due to happen during the course of this year? Secretary of State. Uh, well, Mr. We, we, there are plans to upgrade the A and E. As he knows, I think when I was Chief Secretary, I signed off those plans, but they have been delayed because of some contractual disputes uh, on the ground. And I share his desire to see those expedited because the government has made that investment, and therefore we want to see the operational performance that comes from it. Uh, but he's also right in terms of the announcement today uh, will enable. Uh, ICBs, including uh, within his area, to accelerate their discharge plans. There are already plans in place because of the funding from the autumn statement. What today's announcement does is allow them to go further and quicker in releasing those patients because that in turn takes pressure on the, the A&E department. Barbara Keane. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's one thing to talk about block blocking beds, but care is about staff too, as many yeah. members on this side have raised. How does he expect care homes to cope with this increased pressure when <coughs> one in ten social care posts remain empty and staff feel overworked, underpaid and exhausted? Exactly. And last year, a report commissioned by the Health Secretary's Department reported the rapid discharge of people from hospitals to care homes during the first wave of the pandemic without adequate COVID testing was highly likely to have caused some outbreaks. How will the Health Secretary avoid the fatal mistakes of the past, mitigate against the seeding of more infections to care homes, and the danger, as my honourable friend on the front bench said, that unsuitable care may lead to readmissions to hospital anyway? Yeah. Secretary of State. Well, to her point, and it's a very uh, good one in terms of is there a risk of repeating uh, some of the issues from the past in terms of infections into care homes. Uh, and I think it's uh, worth the House reflecting on the fact we're in a very different position uh, to at the start of the pandemic. Firstly, we had the vaccine, uh, which we didn't have in place uh, for care home residents and staff. Uh, secondly, we have antivirals that we didn't have in place. Uh, and thirdly, there's a huge amount of knowledge in terms of COVID that wasn't the case at the start of the pandemic. So uh, in terms of releasing people into care homes, uh, that risk from an infection point of view is in a very different place to where we were before. On the wider issues of, of workforce, part of the reason for the 500 million at the autumn statement was to put in place support measures for workforce, but it is also why, through our international recruitment, we're also looking internationally to boost numbers. Sir Robert Sims. Uh, can I welcome what the Secretary of State has said about community pharmacies? They've always wanted to do more, and I think because of the pressure on GPs, they could take a lot of the burden off. And if access to GPs is improved, then fewer people will turn up in A&E. Mm. It seems to be a win-win-win mm. situation. Let's go and do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mr Deputy Speaker, with my right honourable friend. I think there's huge opportunities to do more through pharmacists, and that is something that I've asked uh, the Department and NHS England to explore at pace, and I expect to say more on that uh, through our recovery plans at the end uh, of the month. But uh, if I may, I think we can go even further, because alongside pharmacists, I think there is much more scope to work with employers 
There's significant cost to employers, particularly if I take cardiovascular uh, conditions when staff are absent. So it is in employers' interest to work with us in terms of some of the prevention measures. And also there's much more that could be done through home testing. One of the lessons from COVID is that actually the public uh, will do tests at home. And I think in terms of when one looks particularly at the challenge on excess deaths, there's significant opportunities to do more home testing, employer testing, uh, and work in the community, and in particular with pharmacy. Vera Harpaz. Thank you, Sir Roger. One of my constituents fell seriously ill recently. His wife rang 999. It was a Category 2 emergency, then escalated to Category 1. But it still took the ambulance nearly two hours to arrive, and despite the paramedics' heroic efforts, my constituent sadly died. There are now up to 500 avoidable deaths per week due to A&E delays, according to the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Will the government support the ambulance waiting times bill introduced by my friend, the member for St Albans, to identifying hot spots over the largest waiting times and put support where it is most urgently needed? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've seen a lot in, in the media in terms of uh, speculation around the, the excess mortality to which uh, she refers, and uh, it is an issue that I've discussed in detail with both the, the Chief Medical Officer and also the Medical Director for, for NHS England. Uh, and the point to, to note is this is something, firstly, that's happened internationally. Uh, it can't be ascribed just to one uh, issue, as is uh, so often uh, the case. Uh, some of the excess mortality will be due directly to covid uh, itself, albeit that will be a, a diminishing, diminishing uh, proportion, uh, but it is also the case that uh, some of the non-COVID excess mortality will be driven by quite a wide combination of, of factors. So I think we've got to be quite cautious when those sort of numbers are bandied around. Amanda Milling. I have recently had very alarming reports from constituents of mine who have had to wait for over 20 hours for an ambulance. So can my right hon. Friend set out in further detail how the measures uh, outlined today will also support ambulances to reach uh, patients quicker. Well, the, the measures announced today speak to the heart of that issue, which is by putting in more capacity to decompress emergency departments. Uh, what that does is, in particular, it allows more same-day emergency care. Uh, where patients can be rapidly assessed, diagnosed and treated without being admitted uh, to a ward. But also by unblocking capacity on wards, it means that emergency departments can release patients, which in turn creates the capacity for ambulances uh, to hand over patients. What causes the delay in hammer, uh, handovers from ambulances is where the emergency department is already at capacity, and therefore there is an understandable reluctance from clinicians for additional patients to come in. So it's about freeing up the capacity within the emergency department, but it, that is both a, a front door issue in terms of the operation of same day emergency care. It is also about what's happening at the back door of the, of, uh, the hospital in terms of delayed discharge. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State has said the government will now block book residential homes for hospital discharges, but social care is in crisis and has been for many, many years. Uh, and care workers are leaving the profession in droves due to low pay and poor conditions. So what will the Secretary of State do to recognise the incredibly highly skilled work our care workers do and pay them what they deserve to prevent them from leaving to go to supermarkets or Amazon? Because quite frankly, the international recruitment drive is meaningless unless we retain existing staff. Secretary of State. Well, I'd say, Mr Deputy, we need to do both. We, we, we need to maximise the international recruitment, but we also need to retain uh, existing staff. And that is why the Chancellor, in the autumn statement, prioritised, with all the other competing pressures that he faced, he prioritised £7.5 billion into social care over the next two years. That's the biggest ever increase uh, under any government. So it was recognising the centrality of social care in terms of the wider pressures on the NHS. And of course, that 7.5 billion came alongside a further 6.6 billion that was announced at the autumn statement to invest in the NHS over the next two years. Mark Pawsey. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the Secretary of State agree that many of those who are going to need to be admitted to hospital during coming weeks will have reason to welcome the fact that this government, unlike the party opposite, doesn't have a prejudice against making use of facilities from within the independent sector? Secretary of State. 
Uh, well, I, I, I agree. I think it's important that we uh, uh, maximise uh, capacity uh, in uh, the independent sector. That is what uh, we are uh, committed to doing, and I very much agree with him. Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Sir Roger, uh, over recent years I have uh, received sporadic correspondence from consultants based in my constituents complaining about the tax liabilities they face as a, as a result of their pe pension contributions, which forces them to reduce their hours or leave uh, public health altogether. I understand that the Government are consulting on this issue, and it is probably a matter for the Treasury, but uh, how close does he believe we are to an innovative solution? Well, the Honourable Gentleman, I think, raises a point that uh, is raised with him. As you can imagine, it is also raised with me by many senior uh, clinicians. Uh, he is right that it is a question for the Chancellor. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, share uh, the point that he, he raised, but as he knows, tax is a, a matter for the Treasury, and, and now my right honourable friend is considering this. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the Secretary of State knows, there are serious pressures within the NHS in North Staffordshire. And the Chief Executive of the Royal Stoke said on uh, Radio Stoke uh, last week that the key issue to addressing these pressures is dealing with social care. So will my right honourable friend give me the assurances that these measures today will deliver more social care places across North Staffordshire? Secretary of State. Well, I'm very happy, uh, firstly, to give that uh, assurance to my uh, honourable friend, uh, but also I think it's important to see the announcements today in the context of the announcements at the autumn statement and the further announcements made earlier by the government around integrating health and social care through the integrated care boards. And, and those together will not only provide additional funding, it will improve significantly the data which will address also some of the interface challenges that we have when uh, patients are being, who are medically fit to be discharged from hospital so we can better um, ensure that the different pathways, whether it's domiciliary care, intermediate care uh, or residential care, the pathways 1, 2, 3, uh, are operating in a better way. Janet Davey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. During this winter period, my constituents took their two-year-old child to the A&E hospital because of their severe breathing difficulties. It soon became apparent that they needed to be hospitalised and no beds were made available. Some 34 hours later spent in A&E, a bed was then found. I'm sure honourable members and honourable friends from across this house can imagine how scary and how exhausting this experience was for the whole family. Does the Minister view this experience as acceptable? And is this the new norm that the public should now expect for our National Health Service under a Conservative government? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, on, on her second point, I recognise at the, the start of my statement. But in terms of the, the wider point around where specific very troubling cases like that come to life, one of the purposes behind the integrated care boards having integrated care systems having control centres is so we actually get much earlier sight of issues, much clearer uh, escalation. And so these sort of issues then get much uh, more scrutiny than is uh, currently the case. Rob Butler. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. In addition to the substantial increase in the number of cases of flu that my right honourable friend mentioned, uh, the intense cold snap shortly before Christmas put further unforeseeable pressure on hospitals. Stoke Mandeville Hospital in my own constituency saw four times as many broken hips as it normally would in that period. So I pay tribute to all the staff at Bucks NHS Trust for treating those additional patients. And I warmly welcome the Health Secretary's announcement to free up thousands of beds. Does he agree with me that key to that is putting a real great focus on intermediate care and intermediate step-down beds, mm. and that it will therefore be very important for integrated care boards, including the one covering Buckinghamshire, to put an intense concentration on that and on working constructively and effectively with the local authority and the local NHS trust. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think he, he raises an important point, and I think that is the, the, the role of step-down care in uh, releasing uh, capacity from hospital or freeing up capacity in hospital. But I think it is extremely important, and it was a point I was keen to emphasise in my opening remarks, that where uh, patients are discharged from hospital, we have the right wraparound support and care for those patients. It's not simply a question uh, in the next few weeks of discharging those patients. There needs to be the wraparound care as well. He's also right to point to the fact that there have been a number of uh, very significant increases in demand. The 4th 
fold increase uh, that he highlights, that combined with flu, combined with COVID, combined with the pandemic legacy, meant there were very significant pressures. And that demand pressure combined, uh, if I take flu, uh, with an impact on supply, because it also exacerbates staff absences during what was the Christmas period. My apologies to the Secretary of State. Clive Thank you, Sir Roger. I was enthusiastic to make a contribution as you were for me to do it. Um, so, um, what, 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 uh, what contingency did the Secretary of State put in place for uh, a spike in flu cases? Because he speaks as if it's uh, taken the department by surprise, but it was widely predicted that there would be a, 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 a spike in flu cases following on from lockdowns during, during COVID. And he's announced 4,500. Uh, places for easing pressure uh, today. But in his own statement, he said in 2020 there were just 6,000 cases of delayed discharge, just 6,000, as if it's not significant. And that, uh, whereas it, it, last year it was between 12 and 13,000 cases per day. So he's announced what's roughly a third of what uh, he said it was roughly the average per day uh, for the last year. Isn't this just too little, too late? Yeah. Uh, firstly, the, the, the central um, announcement of the autumn statement was the additional capacity to deal with domiciliary care and, and, and uh, further support for social care. That's where the 500 million announcement, and that was part of the 2.8 billion next year, 4.7 billion uh, the year after. So the autumn statement recognised the fact. Indeed, the Chancellor. Uh, I'd have to go back and, and check his transcript, but certainly uh, there were many comments uh, around that period pointing to the fact that this was likely to be the worst ever winter because of both the combination of pandemic <coughs> pressure, uh, COVID emissions, but also the risk of flu, uh, which has transpired to be the worst for 10 years. But in terms of what additional capacity, that is why, for example, we expanded uh, the cohort that was eligible for the flu and COVID vaccine and expanded that to the over 50s and invested in the bivalent uh, vaccine. It's why NHS England put in place an, ad an additional 7,000 uh, beds. It's why we have been uh, rolling out the virtual wards of the sort that Watford General is able to uh, address the equivalent of an extra ward. So additional measures have been put in place. What we saw over that Christmas period uh, in line with what happened in Wales, what happened in Scotland, what happened uh, internationally, was a very <coughs> rapid spike, seven times the increase in flu, over a very short period of time, and that came on top of the pressures that were already in the system. Ruth Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> I welcome the Secretary of State's statement and the new funding announced. In Nottinghamshire, the Nottingham University Hospital Trust had to declare a critical incident between the 29th of December and the 6th of January. They need this new funding to help discharge more patients now. So can the Secretary of State confirm when the money will arrive and start making a difference to my constituents in Nottinghamshire, but also what his department is doing, not only to attract new people to work in social care, but also to try and win back some of those who have recently left? Yeah. Well, uh, to, uh, to address her two points, first, the NHS will take immediate actions to start arranging additional step-down care, so that is a very clear uh, message that she could take to her constituents in terms of the fact that the government has listened and acted on the very real pressures uh, that we have seen. Uh, in terms of, of the wider um, uh, social care, um, if I take she's not in her place now, but an example with the Jean Bishop Integrated Care Centre, uh, actually by co-locating social care staff and NHS staff, one of the things that, that uh, the feedback I received from those staff was that integrated model is actually extremely rewarding for staff. It's a much better way of operating than working in, in silos. And so that co-location, that greater integration between social care and health is actually something the workforce themselves have said uh, is extremely beneficial. Tim Farron. Uh, thank you, Sir Roger. Uh, patients living with cancer and their families and the outstanding cancer workforce will be staggered, as am I, that we just had a statement on NHS pressures with no serious plan being put forward for tackling the deadly cancer backlog. 17,000 cancer patients in the last three months had their targets for cancer treatment delayed and missed. 43% of people diagnosed with cancer in South Cumbria waited more than two months 
for their first life-saving treatment. In North Cumbria, 63% of those people diagnosed with cancer waited more than two months for their first treatment. So where is the urgent plan to tackle the cancer backlog? And on a very practical uh, cross-party level, will he attend, or one of his ministers, attend the all-party parliamentary group on radiotherapy's inquiry on the 18th of January, so we can work together to come up with some quick technical solutions that will actually save lives? Secretary of State. So, firstly, it is worth um, just pointing out to the House that 92 per cent of new patients are starting their cancer treatment within uh, four weeks. But also, to his, the substance of his point, that is exactly why we are rolling out the programme of community diagnostic centres. It is why we have got the uh, surgical hubs programme, in order to prioritise uh, those cancer treatments. And also, given that it was a central part of the statement today, it is rather surprising that the major investment uh, bringing the potential of can cancer, world-leading cancer vaccines uh, from our life science strategy, uh, which could be absolutely transformational for cancer patients, wasn't even referenced there, and it's something I hope he does support because it has the potential to be game-changing. Andrew Percy. Thank you, uh, Sir Roger. Um, the Secretary says absolutely right there is nothing unique to the UK about this. Precisely because there have been record delays at Canadian hospitals, Canadian ERs have been closed through staff shortages, and some Canadian cities have had no ambulance cover at certain times, they have expanded the role of paramedics to enable them to do more diagnostics and also to do prescribing. And as somebody who works in that service, can I just say it's not just about the delays at getting into hospitals. The demand on the ambulance service is driven equally by the fact we have more people living for longer with more conditions, which sometimes require care at one or two in the morning. And the only service that will turn out from the NHS uh, is the ambulance service. So, can I ask him what his vision is for the future of community paramedics and how we can expand paramedic roles, uh, employ more advanced paramedics, and of course put the proper resources into that service? Well, he, he raises a, a brilliant point, and one I completely agree with about how we upskill the existing workforce, how we get more. Uh, uh, people operating at uh, what's referred to as the top of their licence. Uh, we, as part of the discussions we had uh, on Saturday, in number 10, one of the key areas was looking at how we better utilise the existing workforce and their roles and what regulatory changes we need to maximise that. Uh, can I pay tribute to the work he, I know, did over the Christmas period as a community first responder? And he's absolutely right, looking at how, for example, we better integrate the data that's available to paramedics and therefore enable them to do more. That is exactly the direction of travel that we want to take, and I look forward to discussing that further with them. Kerry McCarthy. Um, last month I asked the Prime Minister about a constituent with dementia who waited three hours for an ambulance um, and then spent ten hours in the back of that ambulance in the car park at A&E, and we've heard much worse examples today. I've now been contacted by another constituent who went into cardiac arrest in his GP surgery, waited two hours for an ambulance, and eventually the GP ended up driving him to hospital himself and probably saved his life. Can the Secretary of State give us some confidence that all that he's talking about today is going to filter through quickly in terms of ambulance response times? Because at the moment, my constituents are terrified that if they call for an ambulance, it won't come. Secretary of State. And it, and it, it is, when one looks at the media coverage, a very fair challenge that the Honourable Lady raises. And, and just to give her a sense uh, of uh, what underscores our approach, 15 trusts are responsible for 56 per cent of ambulance handover delays. So the targeting of additional capacity, particularly when one thinks of how we, we target that uh, announcement today into those areas uh, where that is most acute, is obviously one of the, the central things that we're doing at PACE. So there's a very significant concentration of that. There's also opportunities where we look at the, the variation in performance to look at what is working effectively uh, in uh, other trusts, and that uh, combination of control centres, better upstream demand management, is absolutely core to particularly cohorts such as dementia patients. So the significant opportunities to better target uh, the interventions. NHS England have been doing a lot of work on that uh, as part of their 100 day sprint uh, exercise, uh, but there's more we can do, and the funding today speaks to that. Jonathan Gallus. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to first of all put on record my thanks to the incredible staff, both at the Royal Stoke University Hospital and the Hayward Walking Centre, who have been facing unprecedented pressures, and Tracy Bullock and Neil Carter serve their full respect. Mr Deputy Speaker, there's two 
problems we have in Staffordshire. One is that community first responders do not have the blue light ability that was taken away by Westminster's Ambulance Service. When will that be reinstated? And the second is that community pharmacists can indeed do more. I'm delighted that we are going to see them do more, but their core funding does need to increase and hasn't since 2014. So how will that be rectified? Well, on the blue light ability, I'm very happy to take that away uh, and look at that. Uh, as is often the case, these things are slightly more nuanced, as I discovered when we were looking at uh, MOD uh, ambulance drivers and, and their interaction with blue lights. But I'm very happy to look at that. In terms of the community pharmacy, uh, that is something my honourable friend is looking at, particularly uh, in terms of how we better enable patients to get the right treatment in the right place. Uh, and given the fact that community pharmacy is very accessible, uh, actually you get higher numbers in, in sometimes more deprived communities, there's significant opportunities for us to do more with them, and I know it's something that the ministerial team is working on. Justin Matters. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I listened with some incredulity to the Secretary of State's explanation that because the ICBs are only six months old, they're still getting to grips with the link between health and social care. Who does he think was running health and social care before the ICBs were created? It was the very same people. They know exactly what the issues are, what they are lacking. It's a government committed to dealing with the systemic issues facing both sectors. One of those issues, as we've heard already, is workforce and social care. A quick internet search uh, before revealed there are 200 social care vacancies within a 10-mile radius of Ellesmere Port, and we know, as we've heard already, there are 165,000 social care vacancies nationwide. I haven't heard anything from the Secretary of State today about what he's actually going to do that will address those vacancies. So can he tell us, in a year's time, how many social care vacancies across the country does he expect there to be? Secretary of State. Well, in terms of uh, the interaction with vacancies and workforce, NHS England, uh, as has already been addressed in the course of the debate, is working on a workforce strategy uh, for the NHS, uh, and uh, we'll say more on that uh, shortly. Uh, but to his wider point, I think what he's ignoring there is uh, examples like the Jean Bishop Integrated Care Centre, the ability to bring health sector staff and social care staff to work together in a more integrated way. Yes, the Integrated Care Boards uh, was, were operational from July. That's a factual statement. That's when they became operational. So I'm, I'm slightly mystified as to why uh, he thinks that's uh, in, in some way uh, an unusual observation to make. That is just the factual position. Uh, but the point is, when uh, one looks at that, uh, there are opportunities, particularly around how the data is better integrated to understand where the workflow pressures are, where the bed capacity is, uh, and uh, one of the, the causes of uh, delayed discharge is actually around the interfaces as well as what is uh, domiciliary care, what is step down and what is residential. So there's a number of issues and the integrated care board, by bringing that together in a more integrated way, will be one of the ways we improve that. And indeed, that is what uh, his former colleague, uh, Patricia Hewitt, through the Hewitt Review, is looking at. Peter Bowen. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful for the Secretary of State to get into grip with delayed discharges. But as he will know, only a third of delayed discharges are due to social care. Most are do down to the fact that there needs to be NS NHS medical discharges. Now, I've got some good news for him, Mr Deputy Speaker. The bad news is that Spinifield, in my constituency, a 51-bed social care step-down facility is going to be closed. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, if the Secretary of State spends a small portion of that £250 million, the NHS could take over Spinifield and tomorrow 51 beds would be released at the acute hospitals in Northampton and Kettering. Could he agree to it now? <laughs> Secretary of State. Well, one of the things I think my uh, honourable friend actually agrees with is, is devolving more decisions and not trying to run uh, every decision uh, from Westminster. And part of the reason for having the integrated care boards is so that they can look at uh, where best to allocate their funds uh, locally. So I think the point he raises is an extremely uh, important one. He's right that around a quarter of delayed discharges uh, on the, uh, the social care side, a fifth actually the NHS. There's a number of factors within it, so one needs to disaggregate it. But to his, his point uh, in terms of what capacity is there locally, the government is allocating that funding to his local ICB, uh, and I'm sure he will have uh, that conversation with his ICB in terms of where the spare capacity can be best identified and rolled out at pace. 
Toby Perkins. Thank you uh, very much, Sir Roger. I met last week with Hal Spencer, the Chief Executive of Chesterfield Royal Hospital, on the pressures that he and his staff had faced as Chesterfield went into a critical incident over Christmas were etched all over his face. He's, he spoke about uh, the pressures on A&E registrars, on ambulance drivers, of nurses, of coming up face to face with people who have been waiting 24 hours uh, in a corridor uh, on a trolley, or people who have been waiting many hours for an ambulance to turn up. is isn't the reality that this is a system-wide failure 13 years in the making. And didn't the honourable gentleman from Gainsborough hit the nail on the head when he said that Labour have a long-term plan for NHS and this government don't? Secretary of State. So, so the first point that you know is this a system-wide challenge? Absolutely, it's a system-wide challenge, and that is why what happens in terms of demand management. Um, upstream, in the care home, in the home, uh, how we're using innovations such as virtual wards in that capacity is important, just as uh, discharge and getting those patients that are fit to leave hospital is equally important. And so whilst often the focus has been on ambulances being delayed uh, at A&E or the very significant and real pressures within emergency departments themselves, actually the challenge is a much wider one, uh, and that is what the funding uh, at the autumn statement uh, recognised. But to his second point, which is this is about a, a longer term issue within England specifically, I would just point him to the examples in Wales, I point him to the pressures in Scotland, and also the fact that this surge in flu combined with COVID and pandemic legacy that we have seen in England create so much pressure over the festive period is something many other health systems around the globe have also been grappling with. Anna Firth. Thank you, uh, Sir Roger. Uh, I very much welcome uh, this extra funding and I look forward to hearing how much will be coming to South End Hospital, who have had to deal with not one but two critical incidents declared by the East of England Ambulance Service. They have already innovated with modular units and an active uh, discharge lounge. These NHS workers deserve all of our recognition uh, and uh, the, what they need is the capital funding, the eight million of capital funding to reconfigure the hospital, which is fundamentally not big enough. In the short term, would he, would he agree to encourage care homes to take discharges after 5 p.m.? Every day, 15% of the people who need to be discharged can't be discharged because the care homes won't take them after 5 p.m. That's seven, at least 70 people a week who could be out of hospital. This is an emergency. Everyone was put their, their shoulder to the wheel. Thank you. Thank you, well, Mr Tobiswe. On the £8 million sort of the capital request, I, I know my hon. Friend has raised that uh, with me previously. It is something that we are uh, looking at, but she's right in terms of how capital needs to be looked at in the context of getting flow into a local system uh, and where the triaging can be unlocked. On her point about 5 p.m., uh, I think there's two points. Firstly, part of the reason for looking at discharge lounges is if you have something 7 till 7, there's a cultural change for a patient in going into the discharge lounge in a morning and being off the ward. Uh, and that is something, if you look at other health systems around the world, can be very beneficial in terms of uh, accelerating that discharge rather than there being a point in the day after which suddenly it's easier to leave it to the next day for the patient to be discharged. Uh, in terms of the second one on it with the 5pm thing is we need to look at what support the care homes themselves need to have the confidence to take the patient. So I think to be fair to them, it's not simply a question of whether they themselves are refusing to take the patient after 5pm. It's also about is looking at the wider wraparound care package so they're confident in taking that risk so that they're then not just after 5 p.m. on a weekday, but also in particular at weekends when there's often a significant drop in those patients being taken. Helen Morgan. Thank you, Sir Roger. Um, one of the key issues in Shropshire is a shortage of staff across every discipline and at every level. And it's one of the reasons for the horrifying ambulance wait times that I raised in this place on my first day on the 5th of January 2022. This is not a new issue for 2023. So I'd like to ask the Minister, what is his plan to improve staff retention? Because staff recruitment on its own isn't going to plug this gap. It hasn't plugged it in Shropshire, and there's no signs of plugging it across the rest of the country either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, firstly, we are expanding staff numbers. That's why there's 3% more doctors uh, than last year, why there's 3% more nurses 
than last year. But I think it's more than simply looking uh, at that. We also need to look at the fact that we have uh, more elderly patients. Those patients are presenting with multiple conditions. That in turn changes uh, the demands from a system that has traditionally been more about individual specialties into how we're looking at treating those patients with multiple conditions. And that then needs to be factored into what skills the workforce has. And that is why the point from my honourable friend is so important about thinking about uh, roles in terms of what uh, upskilling can be offered to particular roles, how they can take on a wider set uh, of responsibility, and also the role of technology in that as well. So, for example, there are many nurses in hospitals that currently take time looking for beds. Operational control centres with a different cohort of staff, as is already the case in some hospitals, not only automates uh, much of that process, uh, which is far quicker in terms of getting beds back into use, but actually frees up a lot of nursing time for that to be used for actually what the nurses would prefer to be doing, which is uh, uh, focusing on the clinical side and taking them away from some of those administrative roles. James Wilde. Thank you, Sir Roger. Norfolk and Waveney has already received £11 million to tackle discharges, which is making a difference. However, today there are 128 patients in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn you do not need to be there. So in welcoming this additional funding, don't these pressures also underline to the Treasury the long-term importance of investing in modern hospitals able to meet demand and the case for including QEH in a new hospitals programme? Well, my uh, honourable friend uh, very skillfully uh, combines uh, both the importance of discharge at uh, uh, King's Inn but with the, the importance, particularly around the VAC hospitals, uh, of those uh, being addressed on which he uh, uh, has campaigned assiduously. Uh, uh, as he well knows through my comments at the NHS Providers speech, uh, it is an issue that uh, uh, I very much recognise. I have visited the hospital, I have seen the challenges. Uh, first hand. Indeed, my, my son was born in that hospital. It's one uh, I know very well. Uh, we are discussing that issue with the Treasury, uh, and I hope to be in a position to update the House shortly. Roger Bergen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We won't solve the NHS crisis without solving the NHS staffing crisis, and that means sorting out pay. Yet today, in talks with the unions, the Government refused to make a new offer on pay, and the unions say that the Secretary of State is ludicrously calling, demanding efficiency savings from nurses and other NHS staff. Secretary of State. Secretary of, of, of State, many of these nurses and NHS staff are already working 18-hour shifts. So when is the government going to get real? When is the government going to get serious? And when is the government going to make a proper offer to NHS staff to avoid strikes? Mr Deputy Speaker, he seems to be quoting Erne Kabab, the lead national officer uh, of Unite, who was speaking to Sky News outside the Department of Health just a few minutes after uh, my discussions with the trade unions. The, the slightly odd thing was uh, Mr Kassab wasn't actually in the meeting <laughs> on which he was commenting. Ben Bradbury. Uh, it's really pleasing actually to hear from across the House today a focus on uh, capacity and domiciliary care, uh, which actually is huge priority. And ultimately, it's where we want people to end up, independent in their own homes as far as possible. Could the Secretary of State reassure me about some elements of the plan for the NHS to procure care beds? Uh, where does the envisaged staff will come from? And if it's from the NHS themselves, how will we ensure that we don't see more people leaving domiciliary care for what are often better paid NHS roles? Uh, and in the same vein, in terms of capacity, how will we ensure that people are able to move on from uh, residential care beds into domiciliary care when there is that shortage of capacity? Jim Shannon. Well, he quite rightly, as, as befits uh, a leader of uh, his own county council, recognises the importance of that integration between health and, and care. Um, as I say, I pointed to examples already where that has been done uh, extremely uh, effectively in an integrated way. Uh, and it is extremely important. I recognise this in my remarks. The, uh, the medical director of NHS England has, has said that helping people to leave hospital with the right support when they're ready to do so is not just clinically the best option for these individuals, but one of the safest options of expanding capacity for everyone who needs care. So it is the right thing to do clinically, but his point is one we are extremely focused on, is how do we then ensure that there is the wraparound service for those patients who are released into residential care so that, again, they can then move into domiciliary care. 
Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for that? But I know that the Secretary of State uh, appreciates that the winter pressures are only uh, uh, exacerbated by looming strikes. Uh, I, I joined the picket line in Newton Arts Hospital sometime back in early uh, December. Uh, just before Christmas, I had an opportunity to meet Pat Cullen, the leader of the Nurses' Union at St Thomas's Hospital just across the bridge uh, as a protest was ongoing. Um, today in the news, Pat Cullen referred to a glimmer of hope in relation to, to the, the, the uh, talks that the Minister will have with the nurses. Does the Secretary of State believe that real engagement can take place, not simply with the nurses and midwives, but also the junior doctors who are threatening strikes as well? And does the Secretary of State agree that if it is not simply about a pay increase, but it's also about increasing the numbers of staff to secure safety and accountability on shifts in the hospitals tonight and every night from, day, from, night, from the day on? Secretary. Well, I agree that it's a combination of pay, but also wider conditions that impact uh, both uh, recruitment uh, and retention. That is why uh, we have been very keen to engage constructively with the trade unions. Uh, we had a good discussion uh, earlier uh, today, and is recognising that there are a range of factors. If I take the example of paramedics, uh, the feedback from my discussions with paramedics is uh, actually what uh, a number of them said to me was more important to them was pay, was their frustration around the handover times uh, and the delays that they were experiencing uh, in that regard. So it is important uh, to have the discussions uh, through the integrated uh, pay review bodies uh, uh, in terms of pay and what is affordable and what is the right balance, but there are also a range of non-pay factors that are also extremely important to staff. Philip Holliburn. The biggest flu outbreak in 10 years has seen Kettering General Hospital become the 28th busiest hospital in the whole country, with a bed occupancy rate of 96.5% in the week uh, leading up to New Year. The Secretary of State was kind enough to visit Kettering General Hospital last year. He has stood in the busy and overcrowded A&E. He was also good enough to visit Thorndale Care Home, where he was briefed that the increase in the number of over 80s locally in Northamptonshire is one of the fastest growing elderly populations in the whole country. So in thanking the Secretary of State for the measures that he's outlined today and the extra funding, will he ensure that Northamptonshire, the North Northamptonshire Council, the Northamptonshire ICB and crucially Kettering General Hospital get their fair share of the funding he's announced so that we can tackle these winter pressures quickly and successfully? Well, he's, um, Mr. Dorries, it right to point to the very real pressures uh, at Kettering, as he says, I, I, I have visited him. Uh, and not only am I keen to see uh, Kettering uh, get its fair share, I know through his good offices uh, he will absolutely champion it, as he uh, always does in terms of ensuring that absolutely is the case. But he also raises, I think, a, an important point, which is uh, the pressure from an ageing population is not universally distributed. It is more intense in certain areas uh, than others. And, and that, again, uh, is something I'm very keen, in terms of uh, our sort of scrutiny of the data, uh, that is playing through in some of the variation in performance between trusts. As I say, 15 trusts account for 56 per cent of ambulance handover delays, uh, but also there's very significant variation across uh, the NHS. And understanding what is driving that, such as different ageing profiles between different areas, is also a key part of our recovery plans. Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I spent Friday morning at Warrington Hospital to see for myself the challenges that the A&E department staff were facing. One senior clinician said to me, it was the busiest he'd seen in 30 years. The entire hospital was full, there were no beds. And on Monday last week, 90 people were waiting in A&E for a bed, waiting to be admitted. Now the Secretary of State knows I'm waiting for an announcement on whether a new hospital can be funded in Warrington. I'm uh, keen to hear from him as and when that announcement will come. But can he reassure my constituents that the funding announced today will go to support the staff in Warrington Hospital and the social care staff in Warrington to ensure that the uh, pressures that they're facing, uh, both in the hospital and in social care, will be addressed immediately? Mr Deputy, yes I can, and that is the whole purpose of the announcement, because uh, whilst I know he campaigns assiduously in respect of the new hospital, I think he will concede, uh, regardless of that decision, that would take time. 
and I think there is an immediate challenge to his point that the hospital is full around how do we get additional capacity both into the emergency department so that that can operate uh, more effectively because if you have too many people then actually it impedes the ability of an emergency department to operate effectively but also how do we address the wider occupancy of the hospital as a whole because that is core to getting flow into the system. That is the very essence, we, like him on Friday, that is exactly what we have listened to. We have taken on board the feedback from the clinical community, particularly within the emergency departments. Uh, that, that the announcement today speaks to the exact issue that he raises. And finally, with the prize for patients, Sean Bailey. <laughs> hey. Thank you, uh, Mr hey. Deputy Speaker, and I hope last but certainly not least. Um, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, 700 beds due to come online, thanks to the Midlands Metropolitan Hospital, a new primary care centre in Wensbury. I'll say to my honourable friend, when his department does deliver, we do see the benefits. But clearly, that means nothing if we can't get the processes right. And the most pressing issue at the moment for my constituents, particularly during the winter, has been access still to their GPs. And I'm sure members across the House will agree with me on that. So I welcome what my right honourable friend has said, particularly in respect of his use of technology, for example, to ensure people are seen. But fundamentally, people still want face-to-face -face appointments. If you're digitally disconnected, you cannot access this. It's as simple as that. So can I ask my right honourable friend to ensure through his good office, as he stands up and, he, and just after he commits to come to Wensbury to see our new primary care centre, <laughs> that he commits also to work with GP practices where there's best practice, particularly in the Black Country ICB, to ensure that we can enable those people who are digitally disconnected to access GPs. So uh, we are firstly working very actively with the primary care community. Indeed, uh, that was one of the key focuses of the Prime Minister's Summit. Uh, on Saturday uh, in number 10, and it is part of the work my uh, honourable friend uh, is leading through the primary care uh, recovery plan. Uh, I would say in part in that some patients' uh, continuity care and face-to-face -face is extremely important, but if you take the GP patient survey of last year, it suggested that two-fifths of patients, that was extremely important, which suggests for three-fifths, actually speed of access is often, often younger patients is more pertinent. But continuity of care is particularly important for those with multiple conditions, particularly more elderly patients. Uh, but also, alongside that, he raises the, the Midlands Hospital. He's absolutely right. Four years ago, when I was a Minister of State in the Department, I visited it uh, when it was near completion. Uh, and as he knows, uh, four years on, it's taken a significant amount of time to uh, then actually uh, get to the opening stage. Uh, and that is why we do need to look at doing things differently around value for money. Uh, and if I look at the, the hospital estate programme, it is why when nine of the last ten hospitals were built over time and over spec, we need to look at modular design, modern methods of construction, standardisation, which delivers a 35% unit on unit uh, reduction in cost. Uh, operational performance much quicker uh, and enables us to then get those hospitals uh, up and running at a far earlier stage. So it is important we do things differently. Uh, the new hospital building programme is a part of that. But what we have done, Mr Deputy Speaker, is listen to the front line, listen to those concerns. The statement today uh, addresses the immediate issue of bed occupancy in hospitals and the pressure on the emergency departments. Well, uh, my thanks to all of those who front benches and others who have taken part in a very important discussion. Could you now, those who wish to leave the chamber as quickly and quietly as possible, please, we need to move on to the next business. Now I come to the statement on energy business support. Exchequer Secretary Carpage. Um, thank you. With permission, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I will make a statement on how this government is continuing to support businesses, charities and the public sector.